So I would like to invite the different um, speakers to come on stage, please. Um, we're sure to have a very interesting conversation about God and morality. <clears throat> Um, one of the things that we're going to do is we're going to try and jump into the conversation and debate as soon as possible. So we have with us Suhail Ahmed, uh, Wissam, I have Jamal, Armin Navabi, and uh, Khadija Khan, all very uh, active people in their, own, in, in, in their own respect. If you want to find out more about them, please check their bios, or for some of the guys, please, please <coughs> swipe right on their Tinder. I'm joking, don't. <laughs> <clears throat> or, or only fans, there you go, for, for Armin Navabi, if you really want to find out more, at your own risk. Um, but what we're going to do, we're going to jump right in, but we're going to first start off, we have some words from Sahel, who would like to couch the conversation. Have you got a mic? There you go. Thank you so much. All right. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Sohail. Uh, some of you may know me uh, online using the handle I, I use, Reason on Faith. And um, on this topic, uh, we could go on for hours, I'm sure. I'm going to give you a short um, personal uh, story just to open things up. For me, um, questioning Islam as a teenager actually started because of the issue of morality. These days, especially with communication on the internet, you'll have people cite different reasons why they've questioned religion, why they've left Islam. Specifically, a lot of um, people you talk to will, will cite things like incongruency with science and how the scientific miracle claims have been debunked. Others will talk about things like in Surah Kaf, uh, chapter 18 of the Quran, the Dulkarnain character seems to fit with Alexander the Great, which leads to all kinds of problems inside the text. But for me, questioning as a teenager in the 90s, I didn't have access to all of that. And for a couple of years, I was very much into Islam. Uh, as an apologist, you get fed this sort of rosy picture. You're a teenager, you're an idealist. Somebody gives you some structure, and you're very much in tune with it. And I thought, I want to be the best apologist I can be. And so, I decided I'm going to start looking at the things that Islam was criticized for the most. And I knew the issue of women and equality uh, was just uh, a hot spot. And so I thought, I'm going to approach looking at Islam with an objective lens, as, 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 as objective as I could be. And as I did that to try to steel man Islam, and I looked at the Quran, I kept running into problems, things that would trouble me, uh, the inheritance ratio, um, the difference in divorce protocol, women having half the share of inheritance. And I went through all the apologetics there and the commentary in the Quran that I would read, and a lot of it didn't make sense. I'd try to reconcile it with other um, uh, religious books. And through that process, this is prior to these resources out on the internet, just using the Quran itself and our own intuitive moral compass, and I'm sure we'll talk about subjective and objective morality, I was able to question it um, on my own. And I think morality is one of the key areas where I don't think the religion, the religious who try to present it as if it's their strong suit. I don't think they're on solid ground. I think those of us who question religion, uh, in our case, a background of Islam, I think we're on more solid ground. And back in the 90s, I myself put together a book of these questions, and I never published it because my mosque community um, was adamant that only they would get the book and answer my questions. Um, Three years ago, when I came out publicly, I did release the book. But I think um, that morality is a singular issue that can actually topple down the truth claims of religion. Um, and I'm really looking forward to the, the discussion today. Absolutely. I think um, just following on from that, that's one of the first things I think a lot of people who leave religion is like, okay, fine, I've left religion, Islam is not the right religion, or Christianity maybe. It's very easy to sort of say, fine, slavery is bad, or hitting women is bad, but now what? What happens next? How do I find out, find out what is true? 
is there objective morality? Is there subjective? And that opens up a whole range of new questions, which uh, sometimes is not easy to uh, to handle. So I would like to start the, the conversation uh, from a quote from Pro Professor Keith Ward from University of Oxford saying, atheists do not have the resources to know what is moral, meaning <laughs> who do you go to? Where do you go? How do you start? So who would like to take on that first? No surprises there. Okay. <laughs> <clears throat> It's very rich coming from religious people because nothing fucks up morality better than religion. They, uh, <laughs> the, the question is always, they ask us, how could you be uh, moral without God? And we always go into this defensive position trying to justify, like, oh, here's how this is possible, okay? But I, I want to argue that we should actually go on the offensive. The question should be, how could you be moral with God? Because... It's the same people that argue their, their morality comes from um, either taking commands from God or doing what is good for the sake of the reward. They are telling us that they have the keys to morality. But you are, admit, based on your own theology, just following commands. Or that is not morality. Morality is doing good for the sake of doing good. And that's what... Even religious people who are doing good for the sake of doing good, at the end of the day, they have to make an argument for why do good. And that would be not a religious argument, because every religious argument would have to be, we're, com we're following the orders of God. And that is not morality. Right? And also, let me make, make this point. Um, the religions have a record of really horrible conclusions. If you think about all the moral standards that philosophers have been discussing, whether it's deontology or virtue ethics or utilitarianism, every single one of them has have had better results than what the divine command theory comes up with. It's only through religious morality that we can justify the greatest amount of evil. And yet these people are telling us that they have the moral standards, right? Higher, better moral standards. No other mor uh, moral philosophy uh, is capable of justifying slavery the way religious morality does, or wife beating, or sex slaves, or killing of apostates. So it's really rich coming from them. This is like, we have to reframe the conversation. It's not us who has to do the explanation. Your history and your arguments makes the worst crimes justifiable. You brag about it. You brag about Abraham, who decided to sacrifice his own son, and the only justification that he needed for the fact that this is good is because God commanded it. That's your definition of what is good, and that makes all sorts of crimes justifiable. And again, I'm not saying religious people all commit crimes and atheist, atheist people don't, but when atheist people are being immoral, it's because they're not following a moral philosophy or a moral standards, right? But when religious people are committing a crime, Quite often, it's because they are following their moral standards. Great point. Great point. Thank you so much. A quote from a German philosopher, Immanuel Kant. They are told these dogmas is their begin, their morale. The end of dogmas is the beginning of morality. This sums up about this you know, topic that we are discussing today. Religious morality, this phrase is an oxymoron for me. This, this, this is uh, debatable uh, that what is morality, but saying that religious morality is something, I think it's, it's beyond comprehension. That how can you justify uh, slavery how, that was uh, sanctioned by the religious morality? How can you justify religious misogyny? How can you justify religious homophobia? How can you justify that people can be thrown off the roof be only because they choose to think differently, they choose to be differently, they choose different lives? I mean, how can you justify that in the name of morality? But yes, we, we cannot deny this fact that religion does use morality to justify unjustifiable. We see that we have a history of religion and morality deep-rooted in the process of human evolution, but they are like morality is used 
to justify and unjust justifiable, but it has never been the basic tenet of religion or those people who would like to impose their religious values on the wider society. So, um, just before we go into Jamal, maybe Jamal, you can handle this uh, this point. So, a lot of the pushback we sometimes get is, fine, there are things in religion that you might not like, but the end goal, the reason why we can have these morals is because God is going to reward us or punish us. Okay, fine. It's bad, but whatever. Now, as an atheist, there is no God, there is no heaven, there is no hell. So what mo motivation is there for someone to not be bad? Because no one's going to punish you afterwards. That's one of the questions we can get. Jamal, if you want to have a... They, they can have the easy ones, you can have the hard one. You go on, yeah. Yeah, no, this is not a hard one, actually. Because, you know, first you have to understand humanity, who we are, and our history. We are not 2,000 old years old. Humanity is not 6,000 years old. Hundreds of thousands of years old. We have experienced many things, our forefathers. We were a group who hunted, right? And if you steal my prey and I kill you, and your children know that, and their children know that, stealing is not good or anything, through our experiences, I believe, it is there, and it is biological too, in some way. And we have emotions, and uh, we have empathy, and feelings too. And we see what is right and what's wrong. Of course, for some people, something is right, but maybe in some culture, it's not right. There comes in religions, which is infecting anything, everything, when it it touches. So I believe, you know, religions, uh, religious merchants ha has uh, um, hijacked the definition of morality. Because I don't know anything immoral than religions. You know, thank you. You know, when I was a little boy, I look my mother's life. She had to cover herself. She has never got to the school. She is illiterate. And my father beat her. She cannot do nothing. She don't work. And she has no income, anything. And I look, I said, okay, my father is just maybe a crazy man. But I look, my neighbor, woman, more or less the same situation. And I'm, I'm just talking about the woman's situation in religious communities. There is no equality between them. This is immoral. There is no freedom, equal freedom, nothing. So a lot of things men can talk, but you know, I, I think it is very absurd when religious uh, apologists talking about morality. Is it subjective or objective? It is objective because there is no one God and there is no one religion. It is subjective. It is. That's, that's right, and, yeah. And, uh, and yeah, I can continue later. No, no, that's, that's great, that's great. Actually, I wanted to just touch on that about... And, and then I, I want to go a little bit inside the Islam because of, you know, um, morality in Islam, I'm an ex-Muslim, so I'm talking about Islam, or every religion is the same. Everybody knows that be good to your neighbor, right? Try to, don't, try to be bad to your neighbor and see what's happened. Mm -hmm. And this is our experiences in the all hundred thousands of years. We are developing morality. But, you know, in Islam, morality is mostly about women's skin, hair, and what they have between their legs. This is Islamic morality. <laughs> and this is, the, this is firstly the first one. The second one is to be a good, good Muslim. What's the good Muslim? Don't go inside the toilet with right foot. Go with first left. That's don't, very important. Don't eat... <laughs> You, you know, everything is absurd. Every, everyone and, uh, today, when you go to the toilet, make sure you go in with your right foot. Yes. Right. Uh, uh, and uh, and pray, pray to Allah. Pray to Allah and be good Muslim. Muslim. But how you can be good Muslim? Then we find ISIS. Don't be angry to me. I don't say every Muslim are ISIS. But to be a good Muslim, you have to do jihad for Allah. And this is the way Islam expanded, right? And this is the morality to be a good Muslim. Then you find ISIS. You find slavery. You find... Uh, free, uh, like um, um, taking freedom from women, taking freedom from non-believers, 
killing apostates is morality in Islam. And now we can, maybe he can, or other can talk more about Christianity, but I mean is Christianity is the same. Every religion, because every religion is man-made. And our morals in, uh, influence the religions, re not the other way. Absolutely, absolutely. Something to add to that. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, first, I want to uh, just take the opportunity to uh, say that through my uh, religious uh, journey and beyond, uh, I have come from an extensive Islamic background, uh, and I was active Islamically. I was an Islamic scholar, and uh, I had uh, a moment. I mean, it's gradual uh, moving from fundamental Islam to reform Islam into uh, more of an enlightenment. I owe a lot of it to a man who's with us today, uh, Mr. Richard Dawkins, Dr. Richard Dawkins. So, um, I'm not, I know that uh, I know that this feeling is shared by millions of people around the world. I'm not sure if I'm going to ever have an opportunity again to have a podium with the presence of the professor. So I wanted to say that. Uh, I want to tackle this from a, a little bit a different um, uh, angle. Um, and this is something that I struggle with in our uh, culture and community because, um, like Sohail said, the, the, the morality is kind of the, the, the biggest fear uh, that a, a com our community, our Islamic community, uh, experiences when they think of losing religion. So, in, in our culture, and, and for example, Lebanese culture, the word a person without a religion is synonymous to the, a person without morality. Mm -hmm. So I try to, to, I don't think that people think about morality. I think they think more about values, which are packaged morality. And religion is really, uh, throughout history, before the organized religions, it is a packaging of these values. It's stories that package these values in a way that are most... Uh, deliverable from one generation to another. The problem with organized religion and religious institutions is they stop the natural evolution of these values within a community. They they have text and they and they stop time, and then they want to also politicize and benefit from these uh, values. So they resist the natural evolution of society. But these values are, have not come from the sky. A lot of these values are basically packaging of different circumstances, socio-political circumstances, geographical circumstances for humanity. So I try when I'm talking to my family, for example, and they talk about certain values that they perceive as Islamic values. Tell them these are not Islamic values, these are cultural values. Like generosity and anthropology they tell you Bedouins are, are, are generous because one of their sources of information our guests passing through, so and medicine, and you know, so for them, uh, that was a, a way of survival. So, uh, and Islam just packaged this. So Arabs did not uh, find a problem. Islam itself evolved from Mecca to Medina. It's very strange that some Muslims resist change today. Quran totally changed from Mecca to Medina, and now after 1400 years, you cannot change a word. Uh, but even in, in, in Medina, like Arabs that resisted Islam earlier, they took it later, okay, this is a good ideology for expanding and for conquest, and they adopted it, and they never had an issue with Islam. The Islam basically did whatever they wanted it to do. Uh, it is when religious institutions, they wanted to stop time and use the set of values make them religious, make them holy, make them divine, and control society with them, that's when we need to clash with it, and we need to normalize clash. So uh, we established Muslimish, as you know, in 2012, to reclaim Islam, that, you know what, we're, we're not leaving Islam for you. Uh, we, we are also Muslims, and we just uh, realize some of the cultural uh, values that we have inherited and we reject everything that doesn't make sense, that contradicts science, etc. Reclaiming Islam uh, from within and reclaiming these values as cultural values and, and make them go through the process. Now you ask the question, how do we know our values today? I think that's what humanity has done, has packaged values in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and we keep 
improving these uh, the, uh, constitutions, amendments, we keep improving them and pushing them forward. And that's very important uh, to have such documents that we keep improving. And it's a work in progress. We have to confess it's always work in progress. I think, um, be be before, um, absolutely. Yeah. I think be just, just before I pass on to you, I think one of the key points you mentioned was that the, the religions or the movements, they froze time and said, OK, now we're done. Whereas in 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 in, in human uh, in in any venture in, in humanity, there's always evolution, always progress, always changing, always uh, turning. But I know Armin wants to. No, yeah, I want to agree and disagree with you because that's what religion does. Like morality is not one thing. Morality is constantly uh, redefining itself, and people are coming up with different theories for what should be moral and what shouldn't be. And that's uh, religious people think that's a bug, but that's a feature because we're constantly improving it. And religion gets in the way in that improvement. Religion. Um, at, one moment in history, our civilization takes a snapshot and we're like, oh, this is divine. You don't need to go any farther past this. Like, we are constantly improving it and they're trying to make it sticky. The moral system, they're trying to make it sticky and stay back there. But so I agree with you with that. But the d disagreement uh, part is that to move past that, we want to leave Islam and Muslim and everything related to that past, uh, past us. We want to move. We don't want to say, like, oh, this is, we're reclaiming Islam. No, thank you. We don't want anything to do with Islam because what, when you use Islam, you're giving a certain uh, values, packages, as you say, some authority that, or some legitimacy that it doesn't de deserve. But also to um, sh demonstrate how right you are about how backwards this is. Like, your question was, when do, where does morality come from? So morality, the desire for it comes, uh, is, has a different source from what eventually we, uh, what conclusions we come up with. Like, we have a natural desire to be nice to each other, to be kind to each other, to cooperate with each other. And we got these intrinsically from nature, but nature it's flawed. Like our, our instincts doesn't get these calculations that properly because it wasn't meant for the civilized world. So we took that and we constantly are improving our conclusions on what standards to use to benefit the highest numbers of people. So the secular world is constantly improving this. But the religious world, um, just to give you an example, like they, it fucks this up. Because just to give you an example, like, intrinsically, you look at a baby. What do humans feel and think when they look at a baby? They're like, oh my god, so cute. We need to protect it. It's like, it's, it's, it can't defend itself, it seems like. We, we, has this, we have this intrinsic feeling, and we want to protect them from harm. So intrinsically, it might not be perfect, but we at least have those desires. We are, where do we get our morality from? Partly, we're born with it, and then we improve it. What religious does, it looks at a baby, and like, we should cut its genitals. <laughs> like, so, so, and this is like, in comparison, and these are the same people that tell us, like, where, where do you get your morality from? Like, well, we don't look at babies, I want to cut its genitals. So, we're doing better than you, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so, hail then. So on that point, I wanted to come back to and, and steal, man, the, a, a, a provocative question from that professor about, um, you know, atheists wouldn't know. Resources, think, no resources. They don't have the resources. And I think this is a bit of a game of optics. So religions have, um, as Wasan was mentioning, they've got nicely packaged up lists and scriptures. And I think that creates the, the, uh, the, the illusion um, that it's better because it's codified. Whereas with um, modern societies and, and, and free thinkers who have, are leaving these things behind, we don't point to a single book. You know, we might look at the UN Declaration of Human Rights, we might look at charters and different organizations, but because we haven't codified it, I think it's a bit of a game of optics and it's misleading because we don't have a singular book, we don't all gather around and point to that book. And so I think the premise of that question from that professor is flawed because he's expecting that we have some singular source. And instead, as some of my panelists, co-panelists have mentioned, we've evolved, there's a lot of social contract we've learned over hundreds of thousands of years. And if morality, and we haven't really defined terms, but the way the religious tend to want to define it as divine command theory, what God says. And in doing so, we can lump in a whole bunch of things that have nothing to do with human well-being as morality. But instead, if we're clear that morality is rooted in human well-being, 
then we have access to that information. And just because we haven't codified it yeah. uh, neatly the way religious scriptures have doesn't mean that we don't have uh, a way to access some of this wisdom. Yeah, and, and just on that point before I pass on to you, um, when they say resources, I would say, like, this is one of the, actually, I find it one of their flaws. It's like, oh, we have the Quran, the Bible. I'm like, so you've got one book. We have, like, millions. <laughs> we have science. We have economics. We have history. We've got, like, law. Nice. Like, if you want to hamstring yourself and say, I'm only going to get my information for the next, what, for, for uh, uh, eternity from one book, and I'm saying, well, I'll have all the others. I'll go with all the others. Um, so actually, we have more resources to do with access. So I'll pass it to Khadija, then I'll come to you. Uh, my esteemed panelists just mentioned reclaiming Islam. Are we really talking about reclaiming Islam? I mean, ISIS claimed to, you know, to reclaim Islam. And then Taliban are reclaiming Islam. And the Urbandis and you know, other sects of Islam, they are reclaiming Islam in Pakistan, India, Bangladesh. And we see a wave of extremism. We see a wave of intolerance that is just spreading and going on and on and on, killing every person, every voice that dares to oppose them, that dares to say that, no, I don't agree with you. So I think this concept of reclaiming Islam is, is really problematic for me because all the sects in Islam, they all uh, claim to be a reformist movement. It's not that the Islam hasn't changed after a certain period of time. There has been changes, reformist movements, so-called reformist movements, but we see that the, their basic tenets have been very, very radical. Whenever it comes to uh, criticize the religion and uh, so-called religious morality, they would always silence you. They would always reject whatever your reasoning is. So for me, that is a very problematic concept, but yes, uh, religion, when we talk about religious morality, I think we talk about the, def the, the defining lines uh, that have been given to the followers by the religious authorities that you can act within this framework. And that is uh, named as morality, because morality, of course, we know that it's a very decent hu way to live with your fellow human beings. So uh, it, this... Uh, religious framework has been sugarcoated by you know calling it religious morality yep. but i would say that this is limited to one group one religious morality is a bigotry of another one like there is no one thing that can follow all religious people. Every group defines their moral values in their own ways. And we know that these so-called moral values, they violate, uh, uh, they violate human rights, they condone uh, uh, misogyny and uh, killing people for having different views, and uh, you know, so, so on and so forth. So we cannot based our moral campus on religion, when we know that the religious values or whatever religious teachings are prescribed in the scriptures, they are for a certain group. And then there are people within that group that always been uh, silenced uh, because they tend to yeah. differ <clears throat> from the so-called uh, you know, moral code of that particular religion. Perfect. Um, Jamal, do you want to respond? I know you have quite a few coming your way, so I'll let you respond in a second. Yeah, but I, you I just want to say simply, to, to live together with human beings, we need to behave as uh, good, mm. right? We have to have some moral codes, or it will be very wrong. Uh, most peaceful possible to live together you have to behave yourself. And I want to ask public, do you need a book to, be, to behave good? Is anyone? No. Do you need a book from some tribe lived in the seventh century Arabia to be good? Or a book from Palestine, one tribe morality, do you need this? No, we don't have. You know, I'm married with an atheist woman from Norway. And I get shocked uh, first time when I say, I ask, okay, when you became an atheist? I was an atheist all my life, she said. What's about your mother and father? They were too. 
Okay, some place maybe we can find, of course, Christianity. We will find maybe grandfather. You, like I said, mm. it is coming, firstly, of course, when we are little uh, kids from our um, uh, family. But in any case, our morality is coming from, I believe, it's coming from our experiences in the hundreds of thousands of years. We know what is wrong and what is good, and so it is sub subjective. Okay. So, uh, I, want to come back. I just want to come back to I point. just want to say one thing, it. because okay. uh, when I say tribe from 7th century Arabia, you know, it is funny. It is really funny that a religion say that drinking alcohol is immoral, having sex is immoral. Okay, what this religion will give me after Maybe I die? Maybe had a really bad night experience. They will you know give me know. pussy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Can you, and 72 one. Not the person who I can know who they are. I can have family, I can talk. <clears throat> and one mile long penis. I'm sorry, don't judge me. It is not my words, it is hadiths. And is this morality of Islam? And they stand up in the, in the speaker corners in the UK, United Kingdom and talk about objective morality, subjective morality, is there any, like, Islam is oh, without God, no, you cannot do it, uh, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a lot of that. So absolutely. it is really absurd. I think we have to wake up. Yeah. That's it. Thank you, absolutely. Uh, with some, we've had some comments about um, questioning the idea of rec reclaiming Islam. Um, would you like to respond? Yeah, I actually just want to clarify that what I mean by reclaiming is the same thing that Ali Rizvi uh, means in his book, The Atheist Muslim, uh, which means that, the uh, I don't know, because it might differ from one culture to another, but um, from my experience within the Arab Muslim culture, sorry, uh, the, uh, the, the Arab culture re you know, perceives a lot of its values as coming from Islam, and it's, rea it's really not. Islam has come from Arab, many of the Arab values. And so, so there's some additions along the way. So it's important for the, the, because Islam, one of the first things that Islam did is it has undermined everything that was before it. And it's called the Jahiliya in the Quran. It gave a term, the age of ignorance, for everything that was before the first revelation of the Prophet and under, undermined the whole Arab uh, culture and civilization which extended from Mesopotamia and Syria all the way, which Muhammad learned a lot from because he used to travel and intermingle with the Christian Arabs of the north. Uh, and then the Arabs afterwards, I mean, uh, you know, the, the Prophet died in this chaos. And then um, it was an effort. They made a political decision to write the Quran in the language of Quraysh, as you know. It was a political decision. I said that on Facebook, and there was a huge storm that, that ran uh, against me. And then uh, the, um, the decisions, I, I, I believe, and this needs more time to explain, but I believe that 80% of Islam was established by Omar. What, I, what I'm saying is that Islam was established by the cultural and socioeconomic needs of Arabs throughout the first, uh, all the way to the Ottoman Empire, you know, all the way to the uh, fall, fall of Baghdad with the uh, Maghul. Uh, the point, another point I want to make, if I may, uh, is since we are here, and I want to I want to speak now from a from a Western perspective, I want to say something very important, and we can discuss it if you'd like. Is that uh, when we talked about these values, there's always when we when I uh, have discussions with with Muslims, one of the first things that they meet us with is they accuse us of hypocrisy as Western as Western thought and Western Enlightenment values. They right away attack us with hypocrisy. And I want to say that we should be at a comfortable place with hypocrisy. What I mean is, a person is, is hypocrite when they are trying to uh, raise themselves to certain standards that are high, and sometimes they fail because they're humans, and sometimes they succeed. Uh, hypocrisy is just a sign of trying hard. Yes, we have to realize our shortcomings. The Arabs were on the preface in 1919 of establishing a secular state with separation between church and state and 
uh, they were influenced and inspired by Wilson's 14 point, President Wilson. And you know there was a let go. Uh, Elizabeth Thompson wrote a book about this called How the West Stole Democracy from the Arabs. Uh, this, this was a moment where the Arabs saw the West as hypocrites because you have uh, uh, raised the flag of the consent of the governed and then you hit us with Psycho-Spico agreement. Uh, there were colonial uh, value that has superseded the humanist values that Europe was bringing to the Middle East. We realize this now and we confess to it and we're going to keep facing this accusations. What we have to say is that we are trying to raise ourselves to this level. We are going to make mistakes like what's happening in the United States today. We're going to keep self-correcting and all of us, we're inviting you to join us to all of us raise ourselves to these standards. Thank Absolutely, you. thank you. Very briefly, very briefly, please. Okay, so on the one hand, religion is all powerful entity, you know, for religious people. But whenever there is time to take responsibility for something, it's all about politics, it's all about uh, something cultural, and it's not the religion. So when you, there is a lack of responsibility, then that thing eviscerates. Uh, the morality that religious people or religious scriptures they claim to, you know, have monopoly on. So we need to understand these things. And I am uh, aware of this struggle that is going on in Muslim-majority countries where religious people who are moderate and they want to present to the world a very peaceful picture of their religion. And I really support these people. But I don't want any society to base their moral values on religious books because we, we have seen, the history is littered with the examples where you can see that when society base, uh, bases its moral values on religious scriptures, then there is bloodshed, there is discrimination. They burned women alive because they, they, they find them thinking differently. They, they, they kill people. They, it, it's not something that is called morality. We need to un yeah. differentiate these two things. And the secular values, I am an advocate for secular values. Only secular values where all religions and pe people of faith and people of no faith are equally treated can be a solution for these society, Arab society, Pakistan. I'm from Pakistan, basically from Pakistan. I know the similar uh, struggles are going on in Pakistani society. I love those people who fight against uh, religious tolerance in Pakistan. I always appreciate their efforts, but I never want any society, being a humanist, being a secularist, I would say, choose secular values where your human rights can be protected and respected. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, we are, I would like to have a bit longer for question and answer because I know it's a very, very interesting topic, but just by show of hands, I haven't said anything yet. You don't know what you're agreeing to. You don't know you know what, what you've signed up to. Um, but by show of hands, who here thinks morality is objective? Depends on your... Uh, no, no, no. Objective. Just ha hands. It's no, no wrong answer. And I'm assuming subjective. What about not sure? Okay, that's interesting. So I think this is one of the things that, um, as, as, as atheists, we sort of tend to, uh, to uh, sort of get into is we don't know sometimes Bef where to draw the line. Before, I, I would like to get into the subject of objective discussion, but there was something about Islamic reform that was mentioned, and oh, I can't let that go. Yeah. Um, so first of all, regarding this is Islam being an Arab thing or not an Arab thing, and maybe we could keep it because it wasn't, it really doesn't matter. Islam is anti-woman, anti-LGBT, anti-skepticism, anti-human, anti pro-violence. It's backwards. We need to let go of it. The fact you, you don't need to go to Arabs and say like, hey, this is the new Islam and it's an Arab thing so we could keep it. You could go to Arabs and say, it's Islam, therefore you must leave it. Okay, the, we're done with Islam. There's no, the way, if you try to justify a new set of ideology or a new set of moral standards based on the new Islam, at the end of the day, you're legitimizing a methodology that has produced really flawed results. We couldn't do better. Everybody could do, Arabs could do better. Everybody could do better than Islam, right? And also, thank you. And also with regards to 
the reform, when you say, um, I don't agree that Muslim reformists have conclusions, I don't know, I'm not saying that you said that, but like comparing them to ISIS and Taliban, my problem is not that Islamic reform has conclusions that are bad. My, my problem with Islamic reform is that they, they have conclusions that are good, because the, the conclusions are not the problem. When it comes to getting things right, the methodology matters more than the conclusions. Sometimes bad conclusions give you correct results, uh, but more often um, good, good methodologies get better results. So if you use methodologies that are flawed and use examples that get, have given you good results as an example, like, hey, look at these, these are good results, and they are rightfully good results, but by using those minority examples, you're justifying a methodology that more often gives us bad results, yep. right? Sometimes good methodologies, like scientific methods, sometimes gives us bad results. But then what religious people do, go use those bad examples to completely dismiss the methodology. So the Islamic reform, the reason why the good conclusions, like being pro-LGBT, pro-secularism, pro-peace, they are actually more dangerous because they're justifying a methodology, the divine command theory, that is responsible for a lot of harm and a lot of crime, and that's why you should never, never say yes to Islamic reform. Okay. Um, so, I, just, just, I, I want to get to questions to as well. So very quickly, and then yes. uh, um, Sohail, then we go to questions. Yes. I never uh, compared, no. I never, yeah, yeah, I want to just explain that I never compared all reformist movement uh, with IS uh, uh, or uh, Taliban. I just say this phrase, reclaiming Islam, is problematic because people who uh, like to push, you know, extremist ideology, Islamist ideology, they use it. The best thing for us, for the human society, would be to just put religion in its place. It's a personal matter. It should not be dragged into the social and political discourse. Our laws, our, uh, our principles, our policies should be based on humane values, secular values, where all people can be respected. Thank you. Um, and I respond to subjective. Now your new question: subjective, objective. So, okay. subjective. so if I, by I'm just, just <laughs> I'll make you I, to I calm to, yourself down, mate. <laughs> I, I wanted to actually quickly put the objective, subjective thing to bed, please, and, and have a way for us to to easily reconcile this, and that is that God is a subject. So if He's the standard, it, it's arbitrary. It's He's just another mm -hmm. subject. When we look at morality, if we say that the decision to value human well-being is our goal. That may be a subjective um, decision that we make, but having made that as a foundation, having agreed on human well-being yeah. as our subjective goal, now we can, just like in the rules of a game like chess, we can look at objectively moves that increase or decrease well-being. So in that way, morality is very much objective, and you don't need a god Perfect. to achieve objective morality. We just subjectively agree on the foundation of human well-being. I think that's very well said. Uh, I want to um, give some more time to the audience for questions. So if we can have um, a, a mic given to... Uh, yeah, please, please, thank you very much. And uh, that, that was not very moral, what you just tried. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yep, you can pick anyone you would like. Okay, uh, I'm gonna go that man in the red there. I'm assuming you're a man. I don't want to assume anything. Sorry. Yeah. I'm definitely a man. Okay, can cool, you cool. Can, can you hear me? Yep, yep. All right, good. I think in the subject of morality, so we have to separate two things. A, it can be B, and how do you say academic? So I think when it comes to the academic side of it, that's already has been put to bed. Like, this is the Euthyphro's problem. Plato has done, debunked, and is morality good or bad, or is it, is it, should we follow it because it's provided by God, or all that stuff, before Islam, before Christianity, before Judaism. I think most people, or should I say the lay people, it's just that they've been taught this way that, oh, your religion says this, therefore this is what's moral. But what they do not know is, sometimes the things that their religious encourages is actually itself immoral. So what they haven't been taught, I think, is sometimes what we need to tell, or we should be gentle with people when we're talking to lay people who don't know anything about this. Obviously, I do not know about like apologetics and people like that, maybe they have ulterior motive. Yeah. But with you know, lay people, we should need to gently explain to them what actually morality is, how it was spoken about academically, how it is described, 
and then show it to them by way of reflecting their own image. Say, look, this definitely cannot be and good and yeah. therefore cannot be moral. Perfect, yeah. I'm just going to take one more question and then we'll uh, go someone, this man with the beautiful beard and the face mask. Oh, no. Don't make this about communism. <laughs> I won't. <laughs> Thanks for the comment about my beard. Uh, my question is like, that it's it's actually like you know about the like you know Islamic reformists that you mentioned Armin about them. They say like you know just look there's like you know majority of the people believe specifically people from Middle East they believe in Islam and Islam has like you no know, functionality they like you no know, make them to be moral. If you take away Islam from these people, they basically you. They they, 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 they they won't have any morality whatsoever. This, that's what they're saying. And they're saying, like, if uh, basically uh, we like, produce a, a like, you know, ref reform version of Islam, which like, doesn't have anything against women's rights or like, homosexuals, like, I was just watching one of those, like, you know, uh, how to say, um, interviews, one of them say, like, you know, Islam doesn't have anything against homosexuality. It's perfectly fine to be homosexual and be Muslim. Yeah. So, how you evaluate the performance of like Islamic reformists? Do you agree if uh, there is no Islam in Middle East, the people of Middle East, most like you know, Islam stricken countries, I'm talking about, uh, they gonna lose their faith. They are gonna lose the uh, how to say yeah. responsibility to be to be yeah, moral. Uh, yeah, and stuff. I understand. You sort of you're saying is that once you remove Islam completely, there's no foundation, and they're sort of stuck. That's the question. Okay. okay yeah. So. Uh, I know you want to, so you want to... Just ask them, they're like, if you, tomorrow, if you realize that there's no God and Muhammad was not the prophet of Allah, are you just going to go rape the next person you're going to see? They're going to say no. So they know, already know that they get their morality from somewhere else. They know it. And I give religious people more credit than apparently they do because I think they are better than their Allah. They're better than their Quran. And I think that without religion, they're, most of them are capable of being, I think more than most of them are going to come, are yeah. being capable of being moral people, so I don't understand. And they call us a biggest anti against Muslims, and then yet they tell us that with Muslims without Islam, they're just going to randomly murder and rape people, and I think like they're not. So mm. who's anti-Muslim here? I think the, it's, it's, a, it's a bigotry of low expectations. Like they, they possibly can't function without religion, and the moment you take it away from them, they're going to start killing and raping. And we are clear examples that we obviously don't do that. We, we can, I think, we, are, we have all the excuses to do that. We, we don't do that, and um, um, well, as we know, okay, uh, allegedly. I'm joking. Um, so <laughs> I should stop there. Uh, so yeah, sorry. Yeah, you know, uh, religious apologists gives me headache all the time when they are talking about morality. And because, you know, and one thing we have to know that religion and hypocrisy is the same because there are a lot of hypocrisy. First of all, I don't believe most of the religious people uh, read, read their books mm. and learn morality. Like, let's say one example. I know in my family, hundreds of people. No one read it Quran in their language. Everyone can recite Quran like I do, like Papa Gaya. But they never read it. But they have morality. Many Muslim people, Christian people, also have some uh, similar morality like us. So they they are not they didn't learn their morality from religion. So why they are talking about like? Uh, we have to have some books or some divine to... No, it's not. And other things about reform, you know, like I agree with you, uh, never, please, yeah, help God. I say, don't reform Islam. Because this is, first of all, waste of time. The second, mm -hmm. you, you will get ISIS. Because, you know, the, my shoe, if I change color of there and put some things there and uh, maybe cut there a little bit. It is still a shoe. This, this is a shoe. So we have to think deeply. You know, we are living in 20, 2022. Yeah. We have to go on there long before. All religions are man-made people. Really, don't need to get headache to listen to us even. Just go um, away from yeah, religion and live absolutely. your life. Thank you. This, this reminds me of that saying, you could put lipstick on a pig, it's still a pig. Yeah, yeah. Usam, and then... 
Yeah, I, I just want to say that sometimes, you know, we want to be right, but sometimes we want to be practical. So when I want to be right, I'm 100% with you, Armin, that Islamic reform is like putting a lipstick on a pig. It's actually making something dangerous look a little bit uh, more friendly, which can be dangerous in itself. We should face, this is the text, uh, you know, as we know, uh, the, po the people who quote and use the Quran the most are ISIS and these kind of groups. They go directly to the text. The text is riddled with such uh, uh, dangerous information. So uh, we should face it. And, uh, uh, but when I want to be practical, then you know, uh, religion is natural. We saw, for example, in France when the French Revolution tried to get rid of religion totally, like many of us aspire. And that backfired. And the best thing that we can aspire for, I think, if we learn from the other religions' experiences, uh, what Khadija said, that we want a society in which religion is kind of put on the side for those who would like to have that on the side, uh, like what happened in most Western society. And to do that, we have to encourage practically the idea of uh, reform, or at least know that uh, you know, it, it is in some ways an ally rather than an enemy. Well, if you want to make them feel comfortable, you, you don't have to lie to them about their religion. All you need to do is just be nice to them. You could be honest. You could be like, you know what? Your religion is shit, OK? <laughs> but we can still be friends. You need to create an atmosphere where disagreements are normal. And because you feel like people would not receive the attacks on religion very well. So you want to sugarcoat it. I'm saying instead of trying to sugarcoat it, make it normal to shit on people's religion. For, for, it, for it to become normal, for it to become part of society and it's expected. And if you make that normal, people don't feel personally attack when you attack their religion. That's what you have to normalize. Uh, okay. You, you know, I, I just uh, want uh, to... We have please. to go questions. We have to get more questions. Okay. More questions. I, I, I appreciate this is a very, very deep topic, and maybe we can have this outside, but I want to get some more questions. We have a lady in the stair with the glasses. Uh, <laughs> could we have her first? And then a lady behind, and then this gentleman over here. Hi. Um, I have a question. There are some people with, um, who have a Muslim background and they are against misogyny and homophobia and against the death penalty for apostasy. And my question is, um, some people need religion because they can't accept the idea that um, there won't be a life after death. And uh, some people of you are against uh, reformers, uh, reforms uh, within Islam. So what is the solution for these kind of people? Because um, I know many people of them and they are, um, are um, supporting me, for example. I know. And um, yeah. Uh, can I respond, please? Um, it's one, yes, but I yeah. think the reform one, we kind of... It, it's a very good question. Sure, and sure. I know, I know my family are very good people too. But this means... You know, I think these people are bad Muslims according to Islam. Mm. They are good human beings, like my family. You know, the problem with reform, reforming Islam is impossible. Yeah. Or you get to ISIS. But reforming Muslim mentality is possible, like in the West. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we have still Christianity, right? We have church still there and a lot of sects still there. But what happened? How we can sit here? How Christopher Hitchens can sit at church and say it is total stupidity, Christianity? Because they had uh, 300 years of uh, enlightenment age. And this is the problem with Islam. If we can fight against blasphemy laws, and if we speak out, and I go out and say, I, for, I left this religion, this bullshit religion, and get protected. We are living in the West. I understand with, if we some live in um, Iran or, or some Muslim country in Turkey and talk about reform Islam, I, I understand them because there is security reasons. But we are living in the West. We have to say absolutely whatever we want about this religion or my religion or your religion. But the only way, I believe, the only way is freedom of speech. If we protect freedom of speech, we will win against Islam, we will win against any dogmas. And this is the most important thing. Um, so, Hel, very quickly, and then we'll have another question, please. 
I just wanted to add um, to that question. Um, I think this is a problem for those people who grew up with religion and then still need it for comfort. I think if we do a good job of combating and refuting the truth claims of religions like Islam, then in the next generation, it's not really a yeah. problem. And so, yes, in the, in the immediate time frame, I'm not in a rush to you know, deconvert those people. I don't think they're a problem to society. Um, and if that gives them comfort, that's the least of our issues in the short term. And I think that just corrects itself. If the rest of us um, push refuting religion in this generation, next generation will just sort itself out. Just a really quick response, because these questions are usually framed as if we are coming and by force taking people's religions away. Nobody's forcing anybody, everybody could decide what they want to, what they're comfortable with. We're just providing more options, okay? We are actually making it more, uh, more options available for you, so it's exactly the opposite of forcing. The people who don't want to provide more options are forcing one option for you. We are actually making it more free because people always ask us, like, as if we're coming to a, putting a gun to your head. I'm mean, like, oh, leave your religion. We're just on. We are like putting out videos. We're writing books. We're making a podcast. If you are hearing our anti-religious messages, you're coming to us. We're not coming to you. So it's your choice. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question, please. No, I know. Thank you. Uh, I'm surprised, you know, because since maybe one hour and a half, we are hearing a lot of male voices, you know, not letting the only woman speaking, they talking the mic, you know, and they put the you know, and they speak. So we are not out of the patriarchy, you know, for from religion or no religion. You know, the inheritance is here. Sorry for notice this. Uh, I'm just came back with all always the same story, you know, about laicity. Mariam, I don't know if you are here, <laughs> but I think you know when when we are speaking about morality, we see that impossible to make you know laws about mor with morality because everyone can have his own morality. We, if we are not agree about what is morality, what is the values of the morality. So, laïcité in France, that we have to translate, you know, in many languages, because they did it in Italy, they did it in Spain, and I'm asking for all the people, you know, to translate it. I don't know if in Germany they translate it or not, and uh, in England and everything. You know, it's a principle, and for me it's the basis of the democracy, the basis for the equal treatment between all the citizens. It's to separate the religion and the state, and really the real application of that. The religion, or believing in any god, you know, because there is religion and there is also people who have the only believing in God, you know. It's a, private question. You don't have to oblige all the society to apply some, you know, uh, principle that we are not agree about, but civil state, you know, with principle of laicity, it's the only solution. So please, please translate this term of laicity. This is not secularism. It's a principle to have democracy in a, in a country. Okay, um, just before we take another question, I think the accusation of patriarchy is very unfair. We're all friends here. We give everyone uh, a free just, chance. I and just, there was someone else, I, female. I would like to answer. I will let I you like answer. To, yes. There you go. First of all, I appreciate your concern, but being born and raised in a religiously conservative household, it was never easy for me to make my voice heard. I'm here on this stage. I have... Uh, I have done a journey to be here and I have faced a lot to be here but trust me all my esteemed panelists they are very much like me and I am like them and whatever is whatever discussion is happening it's a very friendly manner I am very honored to be a part of this so panel are we. thank so you are we. so Absolutely. much thank you and uh, but having said so I'm gonna I'm cut you right there <laughs> <laughs> I can't help 
So I, I wanted to say that um, religion, uh, we are talking about that how people would, you know, find their uh, basis uh, to have a moral society, to have a cohesive society. So look at China. China, for two millennia, based uh, their moral values, their laws, and their principles on Confucianism, which is not a religion... Uh, religious doctrine. So it's not that the morality cannot exist outside the religion, but in, in my view, it does exist uh, outside the religious framework. It, it cannot exist within this framework, but you, you can have religious uh, uh, values. Uh, uh, you want to call that morality, it's up to you. But morality, I think, comes when we realize that uh, uh, human decency needs more than what somebody sitting on the sky is telling you. And I would like to add uh, Christopher Hitchens' quote. Uh, he said, and I quote, that human decency uh, does not come from religion, it precedes it. So... Absolutely, thank you. I just want to respond to that patriarchy claim. Um, I, no, no, no. Oh, no, oh, no, a man is I think, speaking. I think, I think a man is speaking about patriarchy. Boo. Oh, no. <laughs> Boo. I. What? I haven't even said anything yet. How do you know what I'm saying? It's okay. It's okay. It's not going to be. You can laugh. It's 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 not about I what think, you're going to um, say. I'm just going to make one claim. Okay. I, I think we've gone over this. Now. I think patriarchy is very similar. Has become for some feminists, not all, to the concept of God, because everything that cannot be explained, every problem, every ill, instead of having a nuanced discussion about what's causing it, you are blaming it on the okay. patriarchy. Okay. okay this is yep. this is a disservice to feminism. Okay. This is the patriarchy of the gaps. Usually, what harms society is more complicated than you just patriarchy, patriarchy, patriarchy. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I think we've gone over that now. Um, uh, it's, it's fine. It's fine. Uh, I think we've, we've, we've uh, gone over that very. Uh, so, this gentleman, unfortunately, um, could you? <laughs> Please recognize your privilege before you speak, please. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm a man. I'm, I'm, well, uh, uh, thanks very much for the, for the debate. <laughs> uh, okay. Sure, sure. It's nothing against Nadia. Nothing but so, against. so can I just go back to her and answer her comment about laicity? It's very important. Yeah. yeah. What she said. Please, I've got important questions. <laughs> yeah. Exactly why, but exactly why I said, not most, not all. That was exactly no, the line I used. Uh, Armin, Armin, I think, I think we've gone over this. And I recognize the point, I recognize the point. Uh, but could we have a, uh, the, the question here this man's been waiting? Thanks very much. I've got a couple of points. Uh, f uh, first, I mean, thanks very much for the objective. I mean, you, you raise a point about the objective morality, I think. It's a very good example, especially that chess example that Sam Harris raises as well. Um, so I, my personal opinion, I don't think we can win an argument against a theist if you, if, if you actually de go and defend a subjective moral system. That's my experience. You know that I've done many debates. Uh, but uh, two points. Um, first of all, um, there are Christian uh, philosophers, I can name Charles Taylor, uh, McIntyre, uh, William Alston, uh, the, the list goes on, that they, they defend a moral system which is not based on God. I mean, you know I'm an atheist, I'm, I'm, an, I'm a sort of like I'm a hard atheist actually, but, uh, and I defend uh, an objective moral system which is not based on God, but there are really serious moral philosophers Christian philosophers, uh, uh, for example, uh, McIntyre, defends of this virtue-based theory, which is not based on God, and it's actually defensible. And 
it's not immoral. I mean, because Armin, probably we, we have disagreement there, that he says religion is, is immoral by, by definition. So basically we're claiming that any, anyone who is religious is automatically immoral. However, okay. Yeah, so, can, we get, can we get to the question part? Yes, yes, yes. That, that's the first one. And the second one is, do you think that we have this sort of, uh, um, how can I say it, this, this duty as an atheist towards the atheist community to be as moral as possible and have, have, a, have a rigid moral system, because we present the example, and we've had this discussion before, that if I defend a moral, def, defend a moral system and I don't obey by, by its rules, then I'm actually making a, a really bad image of the atheist sure. uh, uh, secular community Thank you. Yeah. Uh, in front of the theists. Thank you. Um, well, it was addressed to me, should I ask? Yeah, but I'll take one more question before we open up. The, uh, I'm trying to think. Yep. Uh, yeah, sure. Okay. Um, who would like? Jimmy. Uh, I'll let you decide. Uh, yep, yep. I'm blocking you on Twitter. Oh. Thank you, thank you. Okay. I just want to make this really quick point because every time we're down in Speaker's Corner uh, talking about why gay people shouldn't be executed, um, this, this, you know, this, this conversation about is morality subjective or objective comes up every single time. And it's a really exhausting place to have to go to just to say, please, can I be alive? Do I have to get into this big debate just to exist? But when we're looking at um, Islam and morality and Islamic communities, one really useful flip the script example is that you can walk into a room full of Muslims all from demographics all across the globe and you can say, hey, what is the appropriate way to kill a gay person? And mm -hmm. a conversation will take place and your Saudis will say, you know what, you should decapitate him. And your Afghans will say, you should stone him to death. And the Iranians will say, no, 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 no. You have to hang him and hang him in such a way that his neck doesn't snap. Make sure that he suffocates on his tongue. Sim if you do the similar example, you go walk into a room full of gay people and you say, what is the correct way to kill Muslims? You won't even get the conversation going. Nobody will engage with it, and you'll be called a bigot and told to leave. I think it's such a good comparison around, well, who is really moral out of these two groups? That's a very great point, absolutely. Um, it was Armin question. So Armin, then you. All right, two things. I never said religious people can't be moral. I said religious people, when they are moral, they do it based on non-religious arguments, because religious arguments cannot be moral. Religious people can. Uh, with regards to atheists being moral just to present that like it's possible to be moral and sh show a good front and everything, I think that's good, but we also have to recognize uh, that we shouldn't hide our evils, our racists, our transphobes, our homophobes, because we want to show that we don't want to show that you're superior. We want to show that we're the same. We have flaws, and we don't try to sugarcoat the, our community. We, are, we don't try to misrepresent what's happening within the atheist community. We have evil people. We have racist people, and, but we are transparent about it. We don't, we're not a dogma. We're not like each other. Like we're, not, we're different from each other, right? So the argument is not that we are better. The, the argument is that we are different, but you can't dismiss us as immoral just because we're atheists. Awesome. Um, do you want to say, comment on that? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Jimmy. And you know, today earlier I was here in the morning, uh, and uh, I had a T-shirt on me. It is writing "Ex-Muslims of Norway here," and in the behind, it is writing uh, "It is death penalty for blasphemy in 13 countries," and listed the countries there. T-shirt is little old T-shirt. Uh, I had a jacket in the morning. So nobody sees this, but when I will go back to the hotel, I hadn't courage enough. I had no courage, you know, or, or I'm very courageous people, uh, man. But because I was alone, so I didn't, uh, uh, I just take out this T-shirt and took the only jacket, you know, yeah. If Islam was the champion of morality, I shouldn't need to. Think about it even, right? In England, I had this on me because many people, we were many on the street, right? And other things, I have to go back to Nadia's comments. It's very important. It's very important comment about laicite. You know, today, all government is almost in Europe financing religious institute. 
they have religions in the school. And now they are even open the door to Islam and gives more and more places to Islam in the schools. They are opening prayer places. What is all that about? So we need really laicite. Not only secularism, even in Norway, we are seeing this. And this is really wrong. I dr I'm dreaming about a, uh, a world where religion is only private case. I don't need to know which religion you are belong to. And you don't need to know which religion I belong to. You can believe in a stone if you want. Just believe it. I don't care. You can pray 10 times a day to the, yeah. this stone. But don't push your religion to, to establishment, to community, to hospital, to police, to, you know, think just about this hijab cases. Yeah. She wants to be police with hijab. She wants to be a teacher with hijab, judge with hijab. In Laicite, you cannot do that. Because we have a, like, agreement between us, not rhythm. We, we trust each other. We live together and we have to behave. Think if I am a Jew with a kippah and I am a judge and one Muslim comes there, one hijabi woman. What will happen there? If I judge her, she will say, maybe because he's a Jew or the other way, the same. We don't need this thing. We are living in a modern society. It is yep. I, I'm in shock, actually. I'm coming from Turkey. And they tried to have Laicite there in many years. They couldn't manage. Can we just, uh, yeah. Because of uh, victim mentality of Muslims. Yeah, very quickly. And then so don't let victim mentality of Muslims win over, over democracy and uh, secularism and have Laicite, please. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. And one of the final comments. I just want to say that uh, religious people, we, I don't think so. any sane person would say that they are immoral. We, at least I am talking about religious morality. What moral, so-called moral values are in a religious setup, it's given by religious, so-called divine or religious authorities, like man-made laws and policies. They call it morality. They tell you to be a good human being, but not to those people who think differently, but not to those people who choose to live differently, but not to the women who dare to defy the so-called modesty standard that is given by the religious authority. So these values that you get from, the, from within the religious uh, framework it cannot be regarded as humane values or morality standard for, the, for, for all the people in the society because it does not treat people equally. Thank you. Perfect. Any last, la very quickly, any last comments before we wrap it up there? Uh, Rasama or Sahil? I'll just add that I think um, oftentimes when we're having these discussions, we often talk about the, the worst examples from religion. And I think one thing we as a movement have to be um, ready for is that especially in the West, a lot of very progressive sort of modern polish is on religion. And um, I think there are, there's more steel manning that we need to do to address some of those defenders of religion. Because I think some of the obvious examples that we talk about um, are very easy to knock down. And I think uh, further conversation, future conversation, we should work on more of the sophisticated um, apologetics um, because I think they're out there. Thank you very much. Last comment from Sam. Thank you. Uh, just a quick uh, antidote. I told Mariam Namazid that I'm going to say it, is that in, uh, in grade 12 English, my, I was a Muslim. My teacher gave, gave us in Canada, gave us an article about freedom of speech by Salman Rushdie, distributed in the classroom. Me and the Muslim students went crazy. We went to the principal. principal said, it is academic, there's nothing wrong with it. You have to read it, you have to uh, answer to it. I told him, but uh, I want a chance to rebuttal what Salman Rushdie has written as a Muslim. 
He said, uh, you're not Salman Rushdie, so we cannot give your paper for the students to read. But if you write a rebuttal and you get an A on it, we're going to hang it on the wall for whoever wants to read it. Well, it was hung on the wall. Nobody read it. But the point is... <laughs> But the point is, I'm afraid that we are in a time today where the left, the West, the left and the West will prevent such teacher mm. from giving such articles to our right. students. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you, everyone. And thank you, everyone, for your time. And thank you to all thank the panelists. You. Thank you. Thank you, we do. And, and the panel. Thank you. Yeah. We just, yeah, yeah. <laughs>